We read the headlines every day and it's quite evident that the new government under Prime Minister Modi is making the argument that the business environment and the ease of doing business in India has changed considerably. However, what is the reality check of this slogan? Is this even possible to do without proper infrastructure in place? Does the infrastructure story in India get the attention and the scrutiny and the debate that it deserves? They say that to build a nation, you need to build roads. But let's take roads to start with, because we have the surface transport minister here with us, and I thought it would be interesting to talk about them. <coughs> India is confronted with the problem of both quality and quantity. The World Economic Forum itself, in a report, ranked India 27th on the quality of roads. When it comes to quantity, the statistics are even more frightening. From 2004 to 2014, the road-making capacity of India, some estimates say, came down from 20 kilometers a day to 3 kilometers a day. Can the new government change all that? How do we assess the Make in India slogan? Has the world started looking at India in a different way now that there is a new government in place? And is any of this possible without proper infrastructure? Let's introduce our panel today. With me is, of course, Nitin Gadkari. And I must tell you something about him which makes his presence on this panel even more interesting. When he was a Maharashtra politician, instead of Gadkari, he used to be known as Pulkari or the flyover man, because he used to keep building highways and roads and flyovers and pulls. And, and can he bring that reputation to the central ministry, or will he find it considerably difficult? I think that's going to be one of the questions we'll put to him uh, today. On my left is Yorihiko Kojima, chairman of the board of the Mitsubishi Corporation from Japan. Uh, this is very interesting because Japan was, of course, high on the agenda of Mr. Modi's uh, visit. It was one of the most high-profile first big foreign visits. Uh, but what really adds up once the photo ops are over, that's something we'll put to him. Ajit Gulabchan, chairman and managing director with the Hindustan Construction Company, uh, has, a, in a sense, a, a company that has been pioneering in the area of infrastructure, most recently involved with the... Uh, uh, with the ceiling in Mumbai. Those of you who are from Mumbai will, will know that. What are some of the problems, the hurdles, the obstacles he had to face? He'll talk a little bit about that. And Mark Spellman, Global Managing Director with Accenture, based in the United Kingdom. Mr. Gadkari, I'll start with you. It was easy to be the flyover minister, the flyover man in Maharashtra. When you're actually running this ministry uh, in the government, when you find that 1.8 lakh crores of projects were stalled because the clearances were not coming, or because money has actually dried up for public sector banks. How realistic is it for your government to aim to build 30 kilometers of roads a day? I want to give the track record which easily prove that what is the performance of our government. The one thing is very true that before coming to this government, our, our, our infrastructure, particular road sector, facing a lot of serious problems. But now we have already solved the problems. You already solved that. Yes, I am giving you the data about it because it can prove the uh, performance of our government. Project where issues have been sorted out, that is of 17 projects, length 2,384 kilometer, cost is 1,87,000 crores, have already cleared. Projects where later of appointment is given, but withdrawal with good golden shake hand, that is of 4,000 87 kilometer, cost 50,000 crores, project have closed. The what is this golden handshake? I think a lot of people are interested. You're actually terminating <laughs> contracts that didn't work out. So why is that a good that thing? That is a, a sophisticated, it is already the termination of contract. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One percent, one percent they are given to NHI. Because from last three years, the financial closure was there. The land acquisition was not there. Forest environment clearance was not there. Yes. Then uh, railway over beach problem was there. Lot of things were there. Even I just request them two times, three times. But this was the first situation when I requested the contractor and contractor refused to work. And that's why the project of 50,000 crores, they have been withdrawn. Projects behind schedule were issues to be sorted out of 1,800 kilometer, 26 project. The cost is uh, 20,624 crores. It is already going on. Hmm. The problems are there. And I am confident in due course of time, I will solve that problem. Okay, but you've given us the figures. Now give us the honest picture. How difficult is it really to deal with environmental clearances on the one hand, a land acquisition bill that even your finance minister ch says he wants to change, even though your party supported it when you were in the opposition. What is the biggest hurdle to the infrastructure story, uh, Mr. Gadkari? First of all, I want to clear one thing. Any journalist from the country never challenge about my statement. 
what I speak honestly and clearly. If the mistakes is there, I will accept it. Now, here, <laughs> hurdles, thousands of hurdles are there. The main hurdle is land acquisition. And without land acquisition, without forest environment clearance, without lot of things, no clearance was there, and a contractor received the work order. The financial closure was there, and that's why the projects are now economically non-viable. That was the one of the reason. But uh, by in existing laws, there are also many compulsions and binding on us, but we have find out the way out. And now the sector is now running. And I'm giving you the confidence. I am ready to give you the number of projects, name of the projects. It is on my website. Already we have already solved the problem. So let us believe in the leadership of Narendra Modi ji and our government. And in due course of time, my target is within two years. Let it note it down, your record. I'm After two years, you, you can ask me. Within two years, now the, our plan, our ambition is making 30 kilometers per day. And it is presently, it is less than three kilometers. That's what I said in my... But I am giving you the assurance. You can change this in two years. 100%. And you take it on your record. Otherwise, ask me the question after two years in your show, Mr. Gadkari, what it happens to you. Oh, you, can, you are right for that. <laughs> but I am telling you with my full confidence, with positive approach, whatever the things are moving now, I am very much sure about it that uh, we will solve the problems. We are very positive. We want to support the contractors. We are very friendly for foreign investment. We are encouraging the people and the practical level on ground reality, what are the problems we are facing. I am personally taking every time record of every project and I am sure that the problems will be solved. Okay, so please note on record and we will call the minister back here in two years that from under three kilometers a day of road making capacity, you are saying it will be 30 kilometers uh, in two years. Now, sir, you spoke about foreign investment. I must take it now to Mr. Kojima, the chairman of the board of the Mitsubishi Corporation. Japan grabbed the headlines when our prime minister met there, met with Shinzo Abe. You had a chance to actually be part of that meeting. 35 billion uh, was committed in investment. What for Mitsubishi or what for the world has actually changed in India? Is it just a new leader who's promising new things or are you seeing any visible signs of change? Okay, uh, Kojima is my name and uh, I have to respond to your questions. Yes. <laughs> well, a, uh, Prime Minister uh, Modi visited Japan the first and second of September this year. And uh, at that time, say, uh, he had a very good meeting with the Prime Minister Abe. And uh, this is Prime Minister Modi's first visit outside of India. Yes. Japan was the first time. Yes. That's uh, very happy for Japanese. And uh, I was uh, uh, requested to attend that uh, meeting. And uh, uh, I heard the uh, presentation of uh, Prime Minister Modi. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, uh, we are very much impressed with his uh, speech and the presentations. Uh, frankly speaking, what we are doing in the, uh, India, I'd like to briefly explain. Mm. And uh, our company is the, uh, used to be a trading company, but uh, now the trading profit is uh, just a 30%. And 70% uh, profit uh, coming from the investment. Investment, oh, no, you are changing your business model from the uh, trading company to the investment banker? No, no, not only investment banker. We, are in, 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 we invested not only money, but also human resources for those com subsidiary companies. Therefore, in total, uh, globally, 600 subsidiary companies investment already. And uh, however, in India, uh, approximately 20 investment. We have to increase more and uh, always we are watching when is a very good opportunity. And uh, uh, important issue is uh, we invested uh, 600 companies. However, we second more than 200 CEO, chief executive officer, the president, from our company to those subsidiary companies. Important issue is that our employees in the future is the management of high-level people. That's very important for our company. Therefore, in that sense, in our company is always invest and send the people and to add the value for those companies. And eventually, 
profit will be coming to those subsidiary companies. And uh, under such circumstances, particularly in India, infrastructure business yes. and also power business and uh, even uh, railway business and so forth. And for instance, daily metro and uh, we invested. And uh, there are so many others. However, uh, we are always cautiously investing because state by state, mm. regulation and uh, also the uh, uh, taxation, so many issues are it's, different. Uh, different. And uh, there are so few countries like that. Huh? And uh, besides, uh, former government, central government, doesn't, didn't have, a, say, a capacity to control all of the countries. Therefore, every company outside of India invested, and most of them didn't get the profit, and sometimes very big loss. And you're saying one of the big problems was that there was no uniform policy. It kept changing from state That's to state. Right. I'd, I'd like the minister to respond to that, and then I'll come to you, Mr. Gulabchan. The, the fact that the previous government, the experience of, of, of someone as important as the Mitsubishi uh, chairman, is that there was no uniform policy. Now, even today, uh, it's not as if the BJP controls all the states, uh, uh, sir. So wouldn't this be a problem even today for a big foreign company looking to do business in more than one place in India? He is absolutely correct, because in many sectors, there are different laws are there, different systems are there. So uniformation is very essential because in our country, infrastructure is divided. Railway minister is something different. Aviation is other. The roads and shipping is with me. Shouldn't they all have been under you? <laughs> I don't know. It's only the <laughs> prime minister is the appropriate person who can. No, but know. a more serious question. You know, as you yourself have said, don't you, do you not need a converge, you know, a, a merged ministry of tra transport, which also includes railways? We need and a areas. multimodal transport policy for the country. Hmm. Because in some area, the hill area is there, where railway is not there. Yes. So we have to connect by roads. Somewhere we have to form heliports. So now we have started seaplane. So we can use that, take the advantage of water port, bus port, and airport. So there we need the integrated approach for a multimodal transport system. He is absolutely correct. And now, but under the leadership of Prime Minister, he is of the same opinion, and we are forming the uniform policy for that. And uh, in due course of time, I am confident that we will be succeed to form a uniform policy, and what he suggests is absolutely correct. Ajit Kulapchand, uh, as somebody who's had hands-on experience with, with the hurdles, the minister was candid enough to say there are thousands of hurdles. The Land Acquisition Act is one of the most important ones of them. I suspect we will see a change. The finance minister has spoken about it. Mr. Gadkari has spoken about it. But in your experience, what is the biggest hurdle to a company like yours looking to actually do business in the sector of infrastructure? Well, considering the amount of money that NHI owes my company... How much is, is that? It is difficult to be candid. But <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> what I can say to you, the biggest hurdles faced, there are two types of things. We as a company operate as a construction contractor on some projects, yes. and we operate as a concessionaire who takes a BOT project and operates. When you, the problems on both are similar and dissimilar. But one of the important features that has that confronts everybody is the same thing that the minister spoke of. Land acquisition has come in the way, the concession agreements have been given, or even construction contracts have been given, and then the land is not available. Equipment has been brought to site, work is underway, it is stopped several times. So this piles up delay after delay and a cost after cost, and there are consequences. And we're not talking of simple costs. We're talking about sometimes going up to even 50% of the value of the contract. And all this extra money is then borrowed from the banks in order to do it. And, and that creates a huge interest burden, and that has created this logjam. Now, there but, is what, but what does a company like yours do when you are owed money? No, that's what I'm saying. So there is a dispute resolution mechanism in the concession agreement as well as in the contracts. Now, this dispute resolution mechanism has failed in the sense it was meant for disputes, but it is now being used to quantify and price the amount of money that should be given in case of delay or a change. But that is because there's a fear of making a decision for the, for the, for the fear that they will be they will be charged with corruption. 
The same reason every decision given by a dispute resolution body, at the lowest end, the DR dispute resolution, uh, uh, and then to the arbitration, and then to court, is challenged. It goes all the way to Supreme Court, taking years to take a decision. So what's the solution? There. The solution is that, uh, which is underway, which is being prepared, that they must follow the contract and pay according to what the contract says. And have a dispute resolution mechanism that's credible and implemented. Now, I think this is something that the minister is fully aware of and is tackling. It's not so easy to do, given the atmosphere in the country, where this fear continues to exist. It hasn't gone away, even though the government has changed. But with more assurance and the contracts being changed in future, I think this because this is a big, big block. So you're saying the fear of being labelled corrupt, corrupt is one of the big hurdles in this yeah. environment. But in this in this context, Barkha, let me tell you, some of it is fear of being corrupt, and some of them, those who don't wish to take decisions, use this also. I, I'd like Mr. Gadkari to respond quickly to that, and then I'll, I'll bring you in, Mark. The fear of being corrupt. I mean, I mean, you know, you do have politicians today saying our bureaucrats are scared of clearing files because five years later it will be a controversy. Yes, it's a problem because the moral attitude of the bureaucracy is now because every time someone complain then start cbc cba and other thing mm -hmm. so the not taking decision is a good policy for the bureaucrats but because after taking a decision they are facing the problems mm -hmm. but one of the thing what ajit is saying is absolutely correct our model agreement was actually that was a there was a lot of problem in that agreement so we have decided to appoint a committee under our principal cabinet secretary and considering the representative of the trade and business contractors, and we are going to form an international standards of document, a model agreement, which can be not favor to anybody, which can be transparent, and which can be favor, not favor to anybody, but which can be stands on the principle of justification. Because the present agreement is uh, very much against the contractor and bankers. So no bank can finance that with that agreement. There is a problem. So we have decided to change that agreement, model agreement, and uh, we're taking all suggestions from them. And it should be a fair agreement by which it can be acceptable to the bank. And he's absolutely correct, and I'm of the opinion to change it. And it's interesting that you do concede that over the years, bureaucrats have actually got locked into this kind of policy uh, paralysis. Mark uh, Spellman, if I can get you now, how does India today look to to the rest of the world as a destination for doing business. The Prime Minister here is committed to making it easier to do business, but what has actually changed specifically from the outside looking in? Well, I think there's a lot of uh, confidence around India as a country. If you look at the global context, um, if we assume that US and China growth is reasonably okay, you've got the Eurozone, Russia and Brazil, which is in problems, and people look at India, and I think they'll see actually very good prospects. I'd like to take you back, though, having said that, to your first point, which was about quality. Because what we actually went to first was quantity. Yes. And it's easy to jump to the quantity number. I think the really interesting question is the quality issue. And very often what we look at, particularly when we're talking about infrastructure and investment, is that we look at all the inputs. And I think we need to look much more at the outputs. In other words, what is it that we're trying to get to in the two-year time frame? And the key thing from the outside looking in is predictability. And what people are looking for is a predictable path over time. And that's and a the, policy that doesn't keep changing? Well, I think it actually involves a number of dimensions. We've talked a bit about some of the obstacles, and those are things like the land, uh, the regulatory issues, the corruption issues. But actually, I think it's about having a predictable process over time, which then enables you get to get to outputs and to get to a result which is good for India, good for the financiers, and good for citizens. And I think we need to be much more talking about the outputs and the results, not just about the inputs. And I think if we do that, then you'll get that balance between, if you like, government financing, private sector financing, and also international financing, because actually the reality is that you need all three components. And the truth is that it's not just India that's got an infrastructure gap. Lots of countries have got infrastructure mm. gaps. And so India is going to be in a competitive situation with other countries around the world. And let me bring in Mr. Kojima on that. If it is such a competitive environment, and one of the things you said was that Mitsubishi is very cautious about investment, then why would you choose India, apart from the size of the market, uh, to, do, to, to invest here? What... What would offer you the confidence to bring your investment Okay, here? well, say, as I told you, the, uh, when um, Prime Minister Modi visited Japan, yeah. 
in a very good uh, conversation and the meeting with our Prime Minister uh, Abe. Yes. And uh, eventually, our government is taking some pre uh, actions. And uh, very frankly speaking, I heard that uh, recently a uh, name is uh, Japan Plus and uh, a special team which supports and uh, promotes investment from Japan mm. to India. This was established within the Indian Ministry of Commerce and Industry. And uh, this team consists of four Indian governmental officials and two Japanese experts from Japanese Ministry of Economy and Trade Industries. Therefore, Japanese government and the Indian government are now working closely together how to make this kind of uh, investment, and particularly in uh, infrastructure. You know. But uh, I was very happy. Mm. Both governments are working closely together. This is very good news for us. Mm. Then uh, now I believe this is a very, very good timing for Japan to start to uh, develop the investment in India. And uh, we are now st also st working very closely together uh, because the government asks the business companies mm. and uh, our ideas. We communicate mm. with our government. Uh, frankly speaking, former government didn't contact you know, business company, but uh, this Mr. Abe's new cabinet tried to communicate with the uh, business people. And besides, they are communicating with the uh, Indian government. This is very good for us. That's interesting, uh, um, Ajit, that, uh, that Mr. Kojima says it's good that the government, government contact is there. And in Japan, too, you now have a government that's communicating with business, perhaps mirroring uh, what's happening in India. But there is also a view that if business is really to be unshackled, the government, there has to be less government, not more. So uh, there is a continuing debate over what kind of, of, of government Mr. Modi will lead. Will it be a free market government or will it be a government-enabled business-friendly government? And does that matter? Well, it does matter. For example, one big step that which Prime Minister Modi has taken is to dissolve the planning commission. Central planning was at the center of any socialistic economy where resources allocation would be decided by the state. By doing away with that, he's clearly signaled it will be a market economy. When it comes to infrastructure, government is willy-nilly involved. It is the rest of the things that can be privately done. And even when you take the National Highway Authority, barring owning the road and putting all these rules together and implementing it, everything is done by private sector, whether it's feasibility, supervision, construction, operation, etc. So private sector has a role to play, and it is left to play that. But with infrastructure, you will come in contact with government, and it has to be a joint way of doing it. When it comes to roads and other infrastructure, those ministries alone are not responsible for some of the problems that we confront or the obstacles that confront. Your company's bill, it, it has so many problems. It comes in the way of managing and dealing with the SPVs that are required to create concession. Your land acquisition bill, fortunately in this case, also is in the hands of the same minister. But otherwise, that would be another kind of yes. challenge. There are several such things that are happening the Environment Ministry, that is not in the hands of the same transportation No, minister. so are you saying the Environment so Ministry and the Transport Ministry should be with the same no, person? No, I'm not saying that. I'm only trying to say to you that there are many other challenges that need to be solved for this ministry also to be successful. That is all I'm saying. For example, the very high rate of interest, which we still don't understand why it should be so high, the easy explanation of inflation, inflation hmm. is not good enough. Hmm. But this has made investment quite unviable because the cost of capital has gone up. So unless you bring this down substantially, you are still going to have hesitation in bringing in investment. So I'm pointing out the things that are beyond Mr. Gadkari's process. As far as why are we still doing this painful task of wanting it, yes, the cake is big on one side. And we believe that Prime Minister Modi and Mr. Gadkari will do the job. And I'll tell you a small story of Mr. Gargari and me, when he became the PWD minister of Maharashtra for the first time, we were having a CII conference in which he talked eloquently about building a big road system. I said, why don't you build five kilometers of a road that looks like an international road? He was 
he took an affront to this and he complained, this is not so. But it did some good because he went ahead and built the Bombay Pune Expressway, which we were proudly a part of, and built it on time. Yeah. So, and, and the whole ceiling was finally conceived. Unfortunately, he lost his government to complete building it, but it was conceived and awarded approximately the same time as they lost their job. So there was that certain, there is a, a, a history behind it. There is a promise by a prime minister who has done things, and that is why we do it. But the fact is that beyond their own ministries also, there are issues that need to be solved. Uh, I think we However, must get the minister to react to that. I must to the, request yeah. the minister. The pain is quite severe. Please be a little quick about it. Please be quick. <laughs> He's already set himself a two-year deadline. But the interesting point raised by Ajit is about, uh, about ministries that are not under your control. There's a huge debate over what the policy of this government will be towards environmental clearances. The environmental lobby certainly doesn't approve of these fast-track fast clearances. The microscopic minority in the country, they are very much opposing for the developmental projects. We need ecology and environment. At the same time, we need development. We have to find out the way out between the two lines, exact equilibrium, where we can just give justice to both. The eccentric approach for anything, it creates problem. So at the same time, we need good environment. Ecology is very important. At the same time, we need employment and development. The problem is that the some laws which are passed by the parliament, and I'm sorry to say, I don't want to make more comments about it, but a lot of decision taken by the courts. Mm. Now the courts have taken a decision, they want to run government, they want to give directions. And there are a lot of judges, some judges called as green judges also, and they are directly taking decision. Now, as far as our constitution is concerned, I'm very much responsible. I don't want to attack anybody. I respect judiciary. But at the same time in the constitution, all things are clear. <laughs> The media, the judiciary, the executive wing and legislative wing, all are responsible for the success story of the democracy. Am I hearing you say that the courts have been one of the obstacles to infrastructure? And one of the obstacles is media. <laughs> you are the people without any reason, if suppose a small NGO started something, you are just giving a breaking news and you then go on and it. And you stop but, the project. But, but, we, but we, are so meant, the, we are meant to be the watchdogs. We are I meant know, to no, report no, what not, is I will wrong. Tell you, just, that is our job. I will tell you the small example. I construct that uh, Verli Bandra ceiling project. There was a lot of opposition. He was the contractor. In English media, every time they write, Ki, oh, fish mar jayenge. It will be problem for the fish. One day I take all English journalists with me in the boat. Just taking their hat off their nose. Because that was gutter. Drainage totally from Mumbai. So I just asked them a simple question. Is there is any fish? Well, no. Then why you write in the paper? Why you write every time that the, this is a problem for Savarskar Smarak, this is for Smarak, problem for Ambedkar Smarak, and other things, lot of things they write it. Now the bridge is over. No problem is there. And I know how much the people, the, the, the media giving importance for that. Okay, but come back to your point. No, just a minute. I heard me, a small... Me, media is a, media is a soft target. No, media no. is a soft target. No, 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 I'm no, sitting no. here so you can criticize the no, media. No, no, I'm, I'm not your criticizing. point about the courts and the but, judges. No, I, I'm not criticizing media. There are good people in media also. They support me. <laughs> like you. <laughs> like you. I am supporting you. But what I want to suggest to you, this is our country. We want to develop our country. Mm. We want development, we want ecology and environment, we should have an integrated approach. We should understand the feeling behind it. And at the same time, all people, if they are ready to cooperate with me, then I can do it. But everyone says, stop the work, stop the work. No one is coming to me that you complete the work. So are you saying that, are you, you've said your opinion about the media, but are you saying about the judiciary and the green judges that they have an obstructionist attitude? No, I'm, I'm exactly- Or are exceeding their brief? I am exactly telling you the things. If suppose anyone want to run the government, the things are very clear. He can contest the election, become a minister, and he can run the government. But in the media house, or as a judiciary, they cannot take the charge of administration, they can run the business. I am sorry to say, in many cases, the way in which the decision have been given by the courts, it is difficult to execute. I, am not, I have respect for the judiciary, I have respect for the judges, but at the same time, this country, poor country, needs development. We want to eradication of the poverty is our mission. We want to increase the employment potential. We want a super infrastructure of international standards. 
If suppose anyone is going to stop the work, how we can going to solve the problem? Escalation cost is there, interest cost is there, the project cost is the delay is there. After that, the cost, crores of claims are with me. It is only the delay because in the court, I am as a NHI, as a ministry, I am facing, I have to give him the crores of claim. It is from the public money. So this is, we need an integrated approach, supporting from all the people. We want to protect the environment, ecology. At the same time, we want development, and we need support from media also. And the judiciary. <laughs> and, judiciary. and which is going to haul us all up for contempt of court. OK, Mark Spellman. Yes. The, the integration point, because I think that's, that's really important. And can really I just add a question there before you respond? You spoke about predictability, the need yeah. for predictability. Yeah. There could be certain things that are outside of a government's jurisdiction. For example, what the courts of a country decide you know, it may not be in the control of Nitin Gadkari as minister to, to actually question that beyond a point. How do you then guarantee predictability? Well, there's always going to be certain uncontrollable events. I think what we're saying is that what one's trying to look at is what are the controllable sort of parameters. And I, I like this point about integration because I think it's, uh, it's hugely important. And one of the challenges, I think, here is language. And it seems to me that the start point is trying to work out how do you get a win-win. And a win-win means actually that the politicians, the business, and the finance community can actually talk in same ways about a project. And I'm actually married to a politician. Oh. So my, my wife is a member of parliament in the UK. So I actually understand a little bit of the challenges about how politicians speak and how business speaks. And I think that one of the reasons we have difficulties is because very often the politicians express what they want in very different terms from what the business community. And it seems to me that if we're truly talking about integration going forward, the first thing that we need to do is have a common agenda about the things that we can control. And we're beginning to get into those sorts of discussions about, OK, we can isolate out where some of the problems are. We know that regulatory and environmental issues are particular problems. I don't think it matters whether it takes two weeks, two months, or even two years to address them. But as long as we have a predictable time frame for how long it takes to address those, and I think to pick up on, on Ajit's point, we, we also need to know what the escalation processes are through them. But the critical thing I think we need is we need clarity in the process. I suspect there's a capacity issue and a skills issue. And I think we need more t tools to be able to really manage to best practice around large scale what are very complex infrastructure projects. OK, I'm opening this up for questions in just a moment. Briefly from you, uh, um, Ajit. Where is that line between an, integ you know, an integrated approach on one side that the minister speaks about and allegations of crony capitalism and business being too close to government, which, which is something that has dogged the previous government uh, in one controversy after the other? See, as long as the process of giving out contracts, concessions, is, is fair and transparent and open, which quite a bit of it is, there were areas where it wasn't. And that is where the questioning has really begun. So many contracts of NHA have been given out over the years. There's never been a question of an unfair gain given to any contractor. So this is one area. Second is, I think we are seeing crime in every little corner, every two minutes. I think this has also become a bit excessive. But it is important to understand that all these people have to work together in order to deliver the infrastructure that you're building. You can't, you can't, and then you cannot stop things in the middle. Halfway across, you have stopped so many projects. This has consequences, cost consequences, pain, jobs are lost, so many things are gone. So I think there's been a certain element of irresponsibility, arbitrariness in which the previous government did govern itself. You know, environment projects were stopped for nothing else by Jairam Ramesh. For jurisdiction, not because there's an environment violation, and these are things that have had an impact on the people where they feel that all this happens is a part of a, of a thing. And now we need to therefore understand that this has to happen. If we start holding our ministers, our companies, everybody responsible for making sure they deliver what they are expected to deliver on time, you will get a lot more confidence in the business. Okay, we have a few minutes for, for, for questions. You've heard uh, the minister setting uh, a number of deadlines for himself and for his government. What do any of you think are the main hurdles? What are some of the things that concern you? We haven't spoken yet about uh, smart cities, and I want to talk a little bit about that, but I'm seeing a hand going up here, please, uh, with your question. Uh, thanks. My name is Shumit Mazumdar. I have a question for the minister. 
You've talked about 30 kilometers in two years. Very encouraged. Uh, but the fact remains that you talked about how many kilometers have been uh, allocated now and how much has been canceled. So there's really a negative growth over there. You canceled more than you allocated. The issue of land still remains a problem with certain states. While I can see BJP is expanding their states that they control, but there are still some states which are not controlled by BJP. So when can we start seeing traction? We, we, we're taking 30 kilometers in two years for granted. Now when do we start seeing some traction? Ajit has talked about some of the problems that exist in, in the business. So, I mean, would you like to give us some time frame as to we can start seeing traction by so and so time or whatever? After our government, we have given work order of 3,419 kilometers in four months. And our target is up to the March is 8,500 kilometers. The total kilometer length which is in the disputes, we are facing the problems. It is already 2,384 kilometers have been cleared. The work has been started. 4,087 kilometers, the project are cancelled. That I call it as a golden shake hand. <laughs> and the project still there are the problems we are facing is of 1,800 crores. Ongoing projects cannot be reviewed. It's very difficult for me to find out the way out. That is of 250 kilometers. Mm. Problems are there. I'm not talking. This is my target. I am trying my level best to maintain that target. I am confident. I don't know what it happens in future. But today, we have already Prime Minister appointed a committee under my chairmanship with infrastructure and environment ministry, aviation ministry, railway ministry. And we are taking monthly meetings and review. And uh, even environment ministry, railway ministry, they are cooperating. The things are changing. Problems are there. It's not a very easy, easy job. It is a very difficult task. But I always say that there are some people who convert problems into opportunities and there are some people who convert opportunities into the problems. <laughs> so let us believe me, we will try our level best to convert these all problems into opportunities and let give me a good wishes for that. Your wishes and your cooperation, I can be succeed to 30 kilometers per day after two years. On behalf of all of us, we have our very best wishes because this is what we are looking for. Thank you. Okay, before I, before I take the next question, and if anyone has a question, please raise your hand so I can catch your eye. Uh, Mr. Kojima, this, you know, the, this talk of smart cities, of creating smart cities, how, mm. do, you, how do you see this, uh, this proclamation, as it were, by the Modi government? I think uh, yeah, 100 cities is a smart city. That is the plan right now. And, uh, 100 cities not sufficient? No, 100 cities is a good number. Good number, mm. okay. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, not sufficient, but, uh, <laughs> and the first uh, important thing is a symbolic city model of the smart city. That, that's very important. Yes. And maybe a city by city, location by location, the uh, image is different. And however, and even in Japan, this kind of thing is very, very important and uh, for the future. Therefore, in, say, India, this uh, smart city plan, and uh, I was very much impressed with these ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody uh, who lives in those areas try to make a very good city. That kind of effort is very important for the, the local place. And uh, therefore, this uh, smart cities uh, project is a very, very important project for India, and 100, this number <laughs> is uh, good right now, and gradually increasing. Uh, Mr. Gadkari, when special economic zones were created, they were created with, within a sense of creating business enclaves uh, for industry, for manufacturing, but those ran into many, many controversies. Now, if we could not get SEZs off the ground, can we really get smart cities off the ground? You are co correct question to a wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> now you'll say ask the previous government. No, I am not related with the ministry, yes. but I will assure you one thing, yes. that this is also the dream project of our prime minister, and we are planning for that. And there are a lot of plan which Prime Minister has his own vision about it. And what he suggests, there are a lot of good things are there. And in due course of time, uh, I feel that we will accelerate the process of give, forming this new smart city. And definitely the scenario will be changed. Okay. Uh, Mark, la last thoughts. I'm just going to start taking last comments. Remember, if you have a question, you have a few more minutes to get your question in. What has been... 
you know, positive in terms of signaling from the new government and what still remains a grey area? Well, if I just pick up on the smart cities, I think this whole notion of a, of a development corridor which becomes a magnet for attracting investment, for attracting um, particularly sort of manufacturing um, and using that as an economic locomotive effect, I think is, is very powerful. Um, I think the really interesting question is what do you truly mean by smart? Because actually, I'm not sure there's a one-size-fits-all in terms of cities. And when you really talk about smart, what you're really talking about is the power of information to be able to, I think, both not only make the city work effectively, but also make it work well for citizens. So I think there's a work to be done about what truly means, means uh, smart means. But no, I, I think the fundamental issue here is that what we have is, I think, a lot of uh, potential going forward. You need financial stability, and I think that the government is essentially working very hard to create that through reducing deficits, re reducing inflation. That then becomes the vehicle for, I think, um, stimulating uh, both physical infrastructure but also critically sort of economic output. Yeah. And I think the really interesting question, I think, internationally is not just what happens within India but how India also becomes increasingly a vehicle internationally yeah. and how, if you like... I always look at emerging market multinationals and the role that they're increasingly playing. And I think Indian multinational companies will have a role not only internally, but increasingly looking outside, for example, into the Middle East, but also into Africa as well. Ajit? There has been no real definition of smart cities, oh. and just as well, because you need to create this definition. It, it must be widespread because it would differ from city to city. All it means... One of the most important signals this has been given is, for 65 years, we have romanticized the village, that that is the only way forward. And we ignored the cities and said that they were kinds of necessary evils. We have now recognized that the city is important, the town is important, and that it is necessary and it is good. Hmm. And if we are to cre create new jobs, about 300 million, in the next 20 years, if these are children that are born today, yes. then we will have to create these urban centers where these jobs will get created. And then please understand the magnitude. United States, which is the largest economy in the world, has 135 million jobs. So when you talk of creating 300 million new jobs, you're talking about two American-sized economies. It's not simple. Without urbanization, it's not possible. And smartness of the city makes it more livable, better services to people, and therefore can actually be more productive. And it signals that there is a better place to live. And I think this conversation that has started augurs well for India, because it has brought okay. the city at the center of its development. So stop romanticizing the villages. Uh... No, you can continue to do so. There are some lovely songs and folk songs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I've seen some hands go up. Uh, we'll take a question here and then there. Uh, if we can get a mic, please, here in the front row. If we can just get a mic in the front row, please. Okay. 90% of the GDP is created in cities and towns. 90% of uh, innovation is created in cities and towns. Education is created in cities and towns. Yes, pollution also is created yes, in cities Yes, exactly. And towns. I'm glad you said that. Okay, go ahead with your question, please. Yeah, so um, my name is Vikram Gandhi, and one of the things I do is represent, uh, advise a lot of pension plans around the world. And as you know, pension plans are one of the largest investors in infrastructure around the world. And if you talk to them, and as they look at opportunities, this will be for the minister, and Ajit, you had kind of referred to this as well, or Mr. Spellman. The cost of capital in India is just too high. So when, even if you solve all the problems of you know, good contracts, land acquisition, et cetera, when a foreign investor looks at investing in India, you end up with get, requiring hurdle rates in the mid to high teens or the low 20s, which actually, in a lot of cases, even with everything working, will not attract the kind of capital that is required, given, given the objectives. I would just like to get comments on the, on, from the panel as to as you see this, as to how do you think the cost of capital in India need, should come down? I mean, obviously, like you said, there's inflation, but there've got to be other things too which drive everything down. And, and what, what is the government, because this is one of the things which cuts across not just the finance ministry, but a lot of ministries, as to how, how are you thinking about that issue? Mr. Gadkari? He is absolutely correct. I am already on the job <laughs> because I already written a letter to finance minister and prime minister. You've written a letter? Already, already. Saying what? Same word. And uh, in three, four days, 
I have one meeting with the concerning secretaries also, and is absolutely correct. I will pursue this matter. It can be very useful for us. Question here? Yes. Actually, it's uh, pretty similar. So I think, yes, finance. You know, we needed a financier on this panel because, uh, so I'm from Yes Institute, Yes Bank. So there's a lot of innovation going on in financing infrastructure globally. There's project bonds coming up. So we are, I think, at a stage where India could leapfrog onto such new financing mechanisms. So I was just hoping uh, you would realize that while India runs a lot of IT, also our professionals, our people are running a lot of finance globally. So hopefully we can have a forum where we could come and uh, you know, interact with government industry to bring uh, the newest ideas uh, to the table. So especially on financing projects. Okay, uh, Mark? Well, I, I was just gonna to respond to that in the sense that I think it's important that we don't just think about it in terms of uh, infrastructure bonds. I think you can also look at it in terms of social impact bonds because one of the things that uh, I'm beginning to see is, for example, that um, in some of the infrastructure projects, you can then actually sort of employ unemployed people in those completed infrastructure projects and actually the way that social entrepreneurs are able to bring unemployed people in and then help them into jobs in those infrastructure projects that have been built, they can do that cheaper and more effectively than the government can do on welfare. That creates the sort of the upside benefits for social welfare and social impact bonds. So I think it's very important that we look not only at the new innovative financing mechanisms for infrastructure in terms of the physical assets, but I think there's also some very interesting mechanisms for the human capital side of things. And actually the right answer is that we need both working together. Mr. Gadkari, I wanted to uh, ask you something we haven't spoken about, about sanitation. We talk so much about infrastructure, we talk about smart cities, but we're a country where uh, we have vast numbers of our population having to defecate and open. The Prime Minister has committed to changing this, but isn't this the biggest infrastructural change needed? Before roads and airports and big capital and pension plans, where are the toilets? You are absolutely, <laughs> it's a very important issue. I'm also a I mean, responsible for rural development. Yes, that's why I asked you. And now the country needs the policy that conversion of waste into wealth. In my own city in Nagpur, our sewage water we are selling to the electricity board by getting 18 crore rupees royalty from it. We can make waste plastic from crude petrol. We can make pallets from the waste. And there are a lot of things that are there. Even in Ganga, we have to have a disposal of 15,000 MLD of waste, water, liquid waste. So definitely it is one of the important sector where we have to concentrate on it. The sanitation, the toilet, the cleanliness is very important. And a lot of potential, we have to work too much for that sector. We are serious about it. It will take some time for plan. Even for this uh, toilets and other thing, we already appointed a uh, committee under the chairmanship of Dr. Mashilkar for selecting the technology for drinking water and sanitation. So we need a good technology, but cost effective. Because the cost is very important. In the poor area, in the rural sector, the cost of the toilet is very important. Yes. We cannot do that much cost. So if the number will be, the number will be more, but you have to reduce the cost, that is one of the constraint. Even for drinking water, 17,000 villages, we are facing the problem of arsenic and fluorides. Hmm. There are a lot of serious problems are there. And this is a sector where we want to more concentrate for that. Our Prime Minister's vision is for, he has got some vision about it. And it is one of the sector which is neglected. And you are absolutely correct. We will concentrate on that. And from the urban ministry, they are giving the grants to all of these projects from JNRUM. And we will make some good new schemes and by which we will achieve that goal. Okay, just last comments from both of you. We're at the end of time. Mr. Kojima, one thing you'd like to see change in India that would give investors more uh, confidence? Any, you know, any one area that you would particularly like to see traction in? I'm talking about the infrastructure. Yes. And uh, say, I was checking first three electric power, water, railway, roads, and the seaports, and the airports. And the, all those things is very important. But I feel, and uh, Electric power is uh, very, very important. Mm. And uh, maybe an Indian can use the uh, coal for the electric power. Of course, natural gas and yes. other issues, but the coal, and uh, you can make by yourself uh, plenty of coal. And in Japan, how to reduce the uh, CO2 from the coal? This technology is, uh, anyhow, now developed in Japan a lot. And therefore, 
electric power is very, very important. Okay. And uh, renewable energy also uh, very important, but uh, wind power or uh, geothermal power and uh, solar power, solar panel. But uh, it's very hard, and uh, say from the uh, cost viewpoint, and uh, this uh, power capacity is not so good. Okay, uh, mm. I have just a minute left. I say last question, and then um, Ajit, you can maybe take that on. Question, please, here in the front row. Can we get a mic? Yeah. Uh, this is Sanjeev Rai from Bill Innovators. I have a question around uh, smart cities. Why are we not able to define smart cities? Is a question that you know it came across. I was in a panel on smart cities as well, and. Uh, there was a lot of confusion about how to define it, while some of the consensus that comes to is, you know, can we have a rule, for example, a 10, 20, 30, 40 kind of a rule, where it should be minimum 10% more livable, 20% more sustainable, 30% better governance, and 40% more employment. Okay, let the minister answer that, and then I'll give the last word to Mr. Gulabchand. Why can't we define it? Do we need a numerical or a statistical or an empirical definition like has been offered here? His question is absolutely correct, but I am not concerned with the ministry. But what do you I think? Will, I, will say, I will give your feelings to the <laughs> concerning minister. That, that ministry should also be merged. <laughs> <laughs> Ajit, very quickly, you said it's okay to not define the smart city. Here you have a yes. kind of counter view. We have to end I now think, so quickly. I think... Uh, because you have, it has to evolve. If you've got a coastal city, the smartness that it would need in order to be an effective city and a more productive city and a livable city would be very different from a chemical engineering oriented uh, where factories are there. So I think let, let it evolve. Otherwise, you'll get a governmental definition and then you'll not get much, no that. innovation in it. At the same time, uh, we have to get going. And I think it's very important that India, while what is to be done is broadly known. There are many white papers on what can be done. I don't think there is a dearth of knowing what is to be done. And our prime minister is full of clear ideas of where to go. What we want is some speed now, some movement into this. Just get going, you know, remove the debris on the road and move on. Okay. And be very bold about it. There's too much diffidence in about it. Be bold. As Goethe, the philosopher said, boldness has has genius, power, and magic in it. Well, we'll leave it there. The minister's promised that he will let us measure some of his commitments in two years from now, so that's not so far away. Thank you very much. A round of applause for our panel today, and thank you.